Thank you very much, uh, Toda. It's great to be here. It's a great honor to be here and participate in this uh, symposium. Uh, the opening of the engineering building was tremendous. Thank you, Shlomo, for getting us in the country, getting us green cards, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be at a place that appears to be emerging from uh, uh, darkness. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I've traveled, uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, out of the country in uh, more than a year, year and a half perhaps in those areas, and to, to come and, and see the, uh, the emerging openness that we hope uh, is in fact a new dawn. Of, uh, of healing and transformation is, uh, is great to see. And we'll bring it back, hopefully, to the US and the rest of the world and see it emerge uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about health and human flourishing and uh, put the background on why uh, the comments that Susan Samueli uh, just made have to become the standard for care. If not, we're in trouble. And uh, we're certainly going to be in trouble and already in trouble in the United States. Uh, and in Israel is going to follow, I would say, uh, in those areas. So let me give you a few uh, examples. But first, before we do that, I'd like to uh, show you a little bit about the Samueli Foundation as a whole and what it's doing in the area of, uh, of whole person care and human potential. All right, let me just see if, see if I can um, get this to work. Okay, so they're my bosses. They are the best bosses in the world, okay? That's all I'm going to do to further embarrass, okay? Ah, thank you very much. This, this will work. Okay, great. Um, you've heard about the foundation. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in detail, but then I want to talk a little bit about health, uh, the, the topic of this particular session. I'll talk about the uh, health care, and then I need to talk a little bit about the pandemic and what that's done. Uh, to health and to health care in these areas. Uh, the mission of the foundation really is to help produce human flourishing. See the vision here, our vision is to be a resource for organizations that empower people to more fully reach their potential. Uh, this means that people can rise to the top and do the best they can in life in all areas, mind, body, and spirit. The areas of funding are five. I've added a new one for you all, <laughs> social justice, which is emerging. Uh, education, youth services, Jewish culture values, social justice, and integrative health. Let me just show you a couple of things in each of those areas. Education is one of the major areas of philanthropy for the Samuelis, both in the United States and also in Israel. Uh, and here are some of the key programs that the Samuelis have funded in the area of education at UCLA, at UCI, here at Tel Aviv University, and others in those areas. Youth services is also a major effort, uh, both here in Israel and in the United States. Here's a couple examples. The Orange Wood Foundation, which is the leading provider of services uh, of, for foster youth in Orange County, uh, and then a public uh, charter middle and high school for underserved uh, uh, children, which has uh, multiple programs uh, in the area. Uh, in collaboration with the STEM ecosystem in, in Israel, education for youth services has spread also uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, in a partnership with the Rashi Foundation and many others. Jewish culture and values, again, uh, major efforts both in the United States and in Israel. I'll let you gaze over some of these in, in a minute, but you can see, again, involving Tel Aviv University and many others in Israel as well as in the United States. Uh, this particular effort is combining uh, almost all of these areas. Uh, social justice is the newest effort uh, with a few areas in those, er uh, in, 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 a few philanthropic areas in that. Uh, leadership and community programs for high schools, diversity and inclusion efforts, uh, the Woodstock Time Bank, uh, which is uh, training um, poor African-American individuals uh, drawing from the grandmother's wisdom to cultivate medicinal herbs that are necessary for their health and medicine when they don't have access to health care, uh, and then helping them turn that into an actual business, an entrepreneur in those areas. And then finally, health and health care. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And as uh, Susan indicated, integrative health uh, is an important uh, uh, focus of the healthcare philanthropy in these areas. What is whole person care and why do we need it? 
That's what I'd like to uh, convince you by the end of the next few minutes as to why everybody needs it and why our healthcare systems from education to delivery services have to adopt a whole person integrative model. Um, in healthcare, we focus on the patient. Sometimes we call it patient centered care. We ask the patient, what's the matter with you? We make a diagnosis, and we then come up with a treatment. End of story. This is not enough to produce health. In fact, health comes from the person, and most health comes from the person, uh, and that person has to be engaged in, in their own health care, uh, or it won't work. And I'll show you how it's not working when we don't engage in that. That means we have to ask them what matters to them, not just what's the matter to them, and incorporate person-centered care together in an integrative fashion. Here's some examples as to why we have to do that. This is data from the United States. I'll show you a little bit from Israel uh, and ask you if this is something you all need too. But in the US, we clearly need it. In the United States, we are first in healthcare spending around the world, double any other country, and the growth rate is tremendous. We are 37th for all that money uh, in terms of health, according to the WHO. Uh, it's estimated by 2025, 20% of our gross national product is going to be spent on medical treatment care. That is unsustainable. And because of that rising cost, the difference between the haves and the have-nots, health disparities, the poor and the rich, is growing. It's going in the wrong direction in these areas. So that is also unsustainable. Here's a graph that shows you the declining value of investment in medical care as it's currently being done um, uh, by graphing the cost per capita of health care costs versus the life expectancy across countries around the world. Notice I've circled the United States, which is a major outlier, over double the cost of any other country, and yet our life expectancy is somewhere around Czechoslovakia or Portugal. Israel has a better track record in these areas. I'll show you a little bit of that in a minute, okay? Um, uh, the costs of chronic disease are staggering in the United States. This is a 2016 study, uh, or 2018 study by the Milken Institute showing almost $4 trillion from chronic illnesses. I show you this because the majority, probably 60 to 70% of these illnesses are preventable. 50% of the cancers are preventable. Uh, and in many cases, reversible with appropriate behavior, lifestyle, and integrative approaches. Uh, and yet, what we do is simply manage them and spend more money uh, at these areas. So we need to change the paradigm. If you look at where we're spending the money, 50% of our healthcare dollars are going to the 5% of individuals that have serious advanced illness. These are the folks at the top of the pyramid. It took them a while to get there. First, they started off, many of them, as healthy. Then they developed risk factors. We didn't address those very well. But by the time they got really sick, we had a great system that spent a lot of money on trying to treat them late. If we don't change this paradigm, if we don't, in fact, increase the health improvement and even the reversal of some of these chronic illnesses, we will continue to spend more than we can afford. And the problems that I just demonstrated are going to get worse. Israel is much better than we are, okay? Here's a couple data points, but I'll, I'll ask you to look at these and ask uh, uh, whether they um, get you out of the woods, okay? Your life expectancy over the years is better than the United States, and unlike in the United States, uh, who's, where our life expectancy has declined over the last three years, Israel's has continued to improve, but it has flattened. Is it going towards the de declination? I believe it will be if we don't change how we're doing this, okay? What about the cost? Much better. Israel is the third most efficient healthcare delivery system in the world, and that means you spend uh, less than a third than we do per capita on healthcare in these areas for getting the better life expectancy. So clearly better, but notice the, the short blue line there is going up, it's tipping up, uh, and again, the reason for this is because you're very good at the system of delivery. The uh, Israel uh, system of health care, which covers everybody, universal health care insurance, we don't have that in the United States, as well as a few very efficient HMOs that deliver uh, health care to the vast majority of the population can improve this efficiency. In addition, innovations are continually improving this component. 
But this is not going to last very long because both in the United States and in uh, America, we're not addressing the underlying causes of illness and the chronic diseases that I showed you before. Even maximal delivery of health care, and I worked in the military and with the VA for many, many, many years, where they have full coverage, uh, universal health coverage. Uh, and the data has shown very clearly that the way we deliver medical care now only produces about 15 to 20 percent of actual health in the population. And that's because the drivers of health are outside of what we do most of the time. They're in the behavioral and lifestyle components, and they're in the social and economic determinants of illness. I call these the personal determinants of health. So unless we get out of this little black area and begin to address the underlying determinants of health, we are going to continue to spend money that only impacts health in the population in a small way. How do we do this? I believe that integrative health is the way to do this. What we do right now, what I learned in medical school, what still goes on in most health care is in the, uh, the top circle here, conventional medicine. It's the pills and the procedures, tremendous innovations in technology, uh, but it's about the late care that I've just talked to you about. We need to address uh, non-pharmacological approaches that are less expensive, less side effects, and especially the behavior and the self-care components, and integrate them together into our healthcare delivery system. If healthcare wants to produce health, we need to widen that little red spot in the middle and make it routine and regular for all of us. Now we have this little bug that came along recently, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Invisible, right? Yeah, innocent. Just a common cold, right? Uh, and it has had tremendous impact, not only on healthcare, but globally on everything. Uh, who dies from COVID? Well, guess what? The same ones that were dying before without COVID, okay? Those with chronic diseases, the elderly, uh, uh, those uh, in our country that we call persons of color, color black, Hispanics, Native Americans, much higher rates uh, than those uh, in not those at low income, those without health care uh, and without behavior and lifestyle, and those in service jobs, those that couldn't re work remotely from home but had to actually go in and get exposed. This is incredible uh, data that just came out uh, uh, about a month ago from the U.S. Our, health, our life expectancy was declining and is, has been declining in the United States. But in a single year, COVID has dropped that life expectancy by over a year in one year. That's unbelievable decline in life expectancy in the U.S. COVID truly has had a major impact on accelerating what was already happening with uh, poor chronic disease management in these areas. Now we're all uh, taking our masks off, we're all going out. It's over, right? It's done, right? We got a vaccine, okay? Until the next one. Until the next one, and even this one is not over. Uh, a third to perhaps up to 50% of individuals who get COVID and who have gotten COVID will have long COVID. And here's a list of symptoms here uh, that uh, are being documented now from long COVID three to six months later in those, uh, in those areas. And it doesn't have to do with how severe you got it, okay? You can have a mild disease and then develop long COVID in these areas. And it affects every single system of your body. It's unbelievable this little bug gets anywhere in your body. And it produces uh, chronic illnesses across the board, just like chronic diseases do in general. It has also impacted uh, mortality, 60% higher risk of death in the first year after getting COVID than those that don't have COVID, whether you were hospitalized or not. Again, not dependent upon whether you were in the ICU or not. So we need to change our thinking before COVID. We need to change our thinking after COVID, but at a faster pace, okay? And what is that mindset change? That mindset change has to begin to transition out of a mechanical model, an acute disease model, an emergency drug treatment model, a, a reductionistic model to a more holistic model, to one that is ecological, that pays attention to the whole person, mind, body, and spirit, and behavior and lifestyle for chronic disease management. If we don't do that, we'll still be mopping up the floor uh, as the water uh, leaks out of the roof without fixing the roof. 
Um, we need to move to more whole person care. We need to ask what matters and get at the underlying determinants of health. We need to ask about the body and the external. We need to ask everybody about their behavior and lifestyle. We need to talk about the social and emotional factors that drive health. And we need to talk about the mental and the spiritual component, the, uh, the, the meaning and purpose that we all live for. Uh, links needs to be linked to those behaviors and those health and those areas. This is a holistic model uh, that uh, that uh, is about integrative health. So, what is the foundation doing to try to move this uh, in the nation and around the globe? Let me just show you a couple examples that are the newer ones than the ones I showed you at the beginning. Uh, one is a set of simple tools that allow healthcare practitioners to do integrative health tomorrow. Okay. Uh, you can download these tools. They're totally free. Uh, they're called the Hope Toolkit. Uh, it changes the conversation in the day-to-day -day office visit. So the doctor and the patient can actually see this approach and, uh, and begin to do this. So related resources are there, and they're being applied now around, uh, around the country. So these are available. Um, a, one of the biggest efforts in the last few years is to try to transform medical education, healthcare education in these areas. And so the Samuelis have provided a large grant to the University of California, Irvine, to change their entire healthcare schools, there's four of them, medicine, nursing, public health, and pharmacy, into a whole person model. Uh, in those areas. So in the process of making that transformation now, and I'm glad to say there is another medical school that will be built on this model, uh, also uh, funded by another major philanthropist in the United States that's just been announced. We've worked a lot with the Veterans Administration, and here's a report that came out just before COVID uh, that we uh, facilitated uh, on transforming the veterans care to a whole person model. It uh, comes out in the cover report. You can see the wording. Uh, the pilot work on this, the early work on this kind of an approach has shown a savings in a single year of over uh, $4,500 per veteran in a single year of cost offset, so reducing costs in those areas. The Veterans Administration has decided we need to, trans to transform our entire health care system to this type of an approach. Uh, three days ago, <laughs> the National Academy of Science uh, and Engineering and Medicine, uh, with our support, uh, did its first comprehensive study of primary care uh, since 1996. Primary care is the bedrock of healthcare delivery and transformation. Okay? And this report, which just came out, uh, take a look at the definition of uh, high quality primary care. Uh, provision of whole person integrated accessible uh, care and paying for the person by teams, not for the services in those areas in primary care. So stay tuned on this. This has just come out uh, and we'll see what happens in terms of policy and delivery based on that. Okay? Here's one that hasn't come out yet, but I'm giving you a, a heads up because we're the primary sponsors of this. This is about healthcare financing. If we don't pay differently, if we don't pay for the whole person care and what the person needs instead of just the services they need when they happen to walk in the office will get what, we, what I showed you before. And so we've sponsored with the National Academy of Medicine a new study specifically on health financing that produces health. And what does that look like? Uh, this month and next month, there's a series of workshop, workshops. They're free. You can register uh, and hear some of those models that have emerged uh, during the pandemic that have successfully maintained health and provided health care services and then expanded to population health delivery and have not gone bankrupt in the process. Um, these things are being spread throughout the United States. Here's a clinical implementation network that's adopting some of these tools and, and approaches around the country. And I believe we're getting now to the tipping point. I think we're going to get where soon uh, 10 to 20 percent of uh, healthcare systems are actually doing this. That's our goal. Because once that happens, then uh, the others will follow in those areas. And I hope this can happen in, um, uh, in Israel. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the innovative uh, and novel research approaches to COVID that the foundation has responded to. Many of these are in the area that Susan mentioned in homeopathy, for example, or they're inspired by homeopathy, but using hardcore science in those areas. Here's some, uh, some programs, uh, three uh, BSL3 labs are engaged in this research right now. We have three, now four clinical trials. 
the two, uh, the one lab and the one clinical trial that got started first out is actually here in Israel. You can see on the top there. That group is collaborating and providing the scientific uh, input uh, to India, where you're seeing the disaster going on now. And I ha I'm happy to announce that we just announced today, okay, we didn't announce it, but we just did it today, uh, funding a prophylactic study in India to see if we can blunt that. Why do we need this? Hey, we have a vaccine, right? Okay, well, guess what? They don't have the vaccine, at least it's not getting into the population. And these novel approaches that use these low doses, uh, for example, stimulate the innate immune system, not the adaptive immune system that vaccines try to do. So they're a perfect complement to this, okay? They can also uh, be first out, rapid, inexpensive, easy to produce, easy to deliver, and therefore can respond to new strains and other things that, uh, that come out and the next one that comes along, hopefully, faster than we have. We need this kind of research to go on, and the foundation is actually uh, actively involved in participating in this with Israel. Well, I help we're emerging from a dark time <laughs> in these areas. Uh, now more than ever, we need healing. Not just healing physically, uh, but in mind and body and spirit and society. And it is wonderful to be able to partner uh, with Israel. It's wonderful to be able to partner with Tel Aviv University in, uh, in uh, moving that transformation and that friendship forward. Thank you.